Hey good folks, I'm Ben Avram here for CG Dots and in today's tutorial we are going to discuss two methods of illuminating our scene with mental ray. The first one is global illumination and the second one is photomatic lighting. We'll explore the pros and cons of both methods and the way to achieve the best result with each one of those and compare the two together. As you can see I've already prepared us a scene. It's a very simple scene, a cube which will act as our room, three characters, duplicates of the same character that's called Mr. Humpty and it's a very lovely little character. You can find it for free download over at Turbo Squid. Just run a quick search for Mr. Humpty and it's an OBJ file and it was created by Art by Smitty so thank you very much Smitty for allowing us the opportunity to use such a lovely little character let's uh, jump back to Maya we got the uh, three duplicates of Mr. Humpty and to each I've signed a different shader the shaders are Maya and Matteo X passes with a color corrector attached with the gamma correction of 0.454 for the red, the green, and the blue. And the reason for that is that I am going to use a linear workflow throughout this tutorial. If you would like to learn more about the linear workflow and how to set it up, you can hop over to CG Tuts and over there there's a great tutorial by James Within which explains it in great details. Back in Maya, the Maya Material Expresses shaders all have the same uh, settings. Over here I've got uh, an area light which I will use to emit the light photons and we'll get to that in a second. And I've also got a camera here. This scene will be the base one, the unchanged one. Let's go to File, Save Scene As and we'll save this one as Global Illumination Tutorial. Let's start off by setting up the basic render settings. First of all, we are not using Maya software, we want to use Manta Ray. We'll start off with the Common tab. Since I am working in a linear workflow, I would like to enable color management and set the default output profile to sRGB and I want to render an EXR file. The image size I would like to render is HD 720. This actually would be the final image I would like to render. For the test renders I'll render most likely half that size. Let's uh, scroll down to render options. Toggle that open and we'll uncheck the enable default lights since we don't want any lighting in this scene other than the one we are setting up. Let's go to indirect lighting. For the time being we won't be using final gather, we'll be using the global illumination tab. One more setting I forgot to set up for the linear workflow is under the quality, scroll all the way down to frame buffer and here under data type we want to switch from 8-bit to RGBA float 32-bit. Okay, before we start setting up our global illumination, let's take a quick test render. By the way, I've set up the image size to have the size it was before, just to have a quicker test renders. So, a quick test render with uh, no uh, global illumination or any other settings set up. Very simple render, nothing too impressive. Let's save it so we can compare it to future renders. To save your render, we need to press this little green button here, the Keep Image button. Let's turn on Global Illumination and let's run a quick test render. And nothing happens, it's the very same render. And the reason for that is we told Maya that we want to render with global illumination, but our light isn't emitting 
any photons. So to take care of that, make sure our light is selected. We'll go to the Mental Ray tab and under Caustic and Global Illumination we need to switch on Emit Photons. Now the basic settings here are 8000 Intensity and 10,000 Global Illumination Photons. Now what are Photons? Well, Photons basically are the stuff that light is made of. In the real world there is an endless amount of particles that's been emitted by the sun and, and by uh, lamps and so on that bounce around in space from uh, different surfaces and as I said in real life we have endless amount of uh, photons however in Maya we have to limit that amount that's why we have this uh, tab here if you will try to emit endless amount of photons in Maya it would probably burst down in tears crash and most likely press charges. So we have to limit the amount of photons being emitted. Okay, with that said, let's uh, run a quick test render. Basic settings, I haven't changed anything. Global illumination in the radiance settings and emit photons in the area light turned on. And immediately you can see that something different has happened here. First of all, we got more light in the scene, and we've got these uh, blotchy uh, spots on the on the walls. We can see those here and somewhat here. Well, what these blotchy spots are is actually the photons that have been shot of the area light, bounced from the walls to, to the characters and back to the walls and vice versa. And that is the reason we have these green spots and orange spots and purple spots all around at the wall, since those uh, photons that bounce back and forth carry the color information of the surface they bounced from. <coughs> now the correct way of rendering with global illumination is to set the decay rate from no decay to any sort of this decay, the linear, the quadratic or the cubic. Usually I would prefer the cubic and then start to dialing up the intensity until we get a nice decay rate and after that start to play around with the settings in the caustic and global illumination and the global illumination in the redness settings. As I said, that's the correct way of rendering a global illumination. Now that said, I would like to now turn off the intensity. So right now we have no intensity, the area light is illuminating zero amount of light. And as I said, this is not the correct way of rendering with global illumination. My reason for doing this is so we can understand a bit more clearly the way photons illuminate our scene. Let's save this image and let's do another quick test render. And now you can see how the photons cover the entire scene. And actually there's another method of viewing the photons. If we'll toggle down the photon map and we'll enable the map visualizer. Let's run a quick test render once more. Now there's no, no real change in the render view, but if we'll switch to perspective view, you can see all these spots in our scene. And we've got something new in our outliner which is just a map visualizer. So any one of these spots represent one of the 10,000 photons. Okay, this is not the actual photon, this is just a representation of the photon. And that really helps us to understand better how the photons illuminate the scene. So let's switch back to CAM. Let's start exploring the ways to illuminate our scene a bit better. On the render settings we can change the amount of accuracy, the scale, the radius and the merge distance. For now I'm going to keep those uh, settings at their default state and on the right I'm going to start uh, dialing up the photon intensity. Actually I'm going to bump it quite a bit. Let's start by doubling up the amount. Now the photon intensity 
stands for the amount of intensity for each single photon. So let's uh, let's see how that looks. We didn't save the last render, but we can automatically see that we have a lot more light in the scene. The blotchiness hasn't changed, and I'm going to keep on dialing up the photon intensity until I get the right amount of brightness in the scene, and then I'm going to start uh, dealing with the blotchiness. So let's uh, save this image and double this once more, 32. Okay, getting brighter. 64. We're getting a bit of a burn on some pl some points, and this is actually something I'm aiming for at the moment. Let's double it one more time. Okay, so we're getting a real burned, burned out uh, scene. Let's save this. And obviously we don't want this amount of uh, burn in our scene. Now is the time to start dialing up the settings in the global illumination in the render settings. Oh, very important thing I forgot to say. I'm very sorry about that. Scale. Scale is extremely important when rendering with manta ray in general and particularly with global illumination. And right now I'm working with centimeters. By the way, for to get the preference with the window, I've pressed this little button here. You, you can also reach it by going to Window, Settings and Preferences, Preferences. Anyway, under Settings, my working units right now are set to centimeters. If I'll set it to meters, or the scene size, or the scene scale, would increase dramatically, and I would need a lot more photons to light my scene up, which will cause um, slower render times. Over at the render settings, we have the merge distance. The default value of zero it means that Maya is automatically trying to set up the merge distance the best it can and it's not doing a great job at that. We need to set up the merge distance to 1. Now let's run a quick test render of that. And now we can see the individual illumination of each photon, which is... actually it's quite an interesting look, I think so. But it might not be the look we're after. Let's save this. And now let's start dialing up the radius. Let's set it to 3. Radius means the radius of each photon. So we'll start increasing the size of each photon and they would start to merge together. Let's render that. Okay, now we can see we increased the size of the photon, the radius of the photons and we immediately get a nicer result than we had before. Let's save this render. Let's dial up this uh, radius. Let's double it to 6. Run a quick test render. Okay, getting nicer. We have some blotchiness on the walls. Save this. Let's uh, set it to 9. Okay, much better. We need to keep on dialing these uh, settings until we have no more um, effect. Let's set it to 12. I think we need some more photons in our scene to light the scene better. Let's double up the global illumination photons. Save this render and render it again. We're starting to see more details. Let's raise it to 30,000. Okay, one more time I think we can go all the way to 40,000. And we really get some more details in the scene now. Oh. Okay, so I've continued on to working on the scene. I've raised the photon intensity to 140,000. I've raised the amount of photons to 3 million. The accuracy is, has reached 1200 and the radius is 21. And this is the result I've got, which is okay, it's nice, it's illuminated, nothing too impressive, we've got some blotchiness on the walls. 
Let's toggle down the Photon Tracing in the Render Settings. We got the Photon Reflection, Photon Refraction and the Max Photon Depth and they are all set to 5. That means that each Photon is being shot out the area light, hitting the green person once, hitting the wall, that's 2 times, hitting the other wall 3 times, hitting back the green person, that's 4 times, and hitting the wall again, that's 5 times, and then it completely dies. So that's the decay rate for all those photons. And I would like to set the decay to 10, so they would hit the object in our scene 10 times before they will die. So I'll set the reflection to 10, and the max depth to 10. Since I'm not rendering any caustics, I don't have refraction in the scene, so I will turn this to zero just to save some calculation time for Maya. Now let's save this image and render this again. Now as you can see the render times are getting larger and larger and that helps us help get rid of the blotchiness on the walls. To really tighten up this render, I would like to introduce the final gather to the render. And before that I would like to create an image based lighting, so I'll go to image based lighting and create and I'll insert an HDR image that, that I have and turn on final gather. Let's see how that works. Well, now as you can see we are starting to get some really interesting result. We are starting to get the light spill, the ambient occlusion shadow and so on. Let's toggle down the final gather tracing. I would like to have some more bouncing of the final gather. So we'll set it to 5 for the reflections, 5 for the refraction even though we don't have any in our scene and the max trace depth to 10. Well, as you can see I've paused the recording once again and I've continued on to dialing up and down the numbers. The numbers I'm at now are for the global illumination I'm using 1200 accuracy, 21 for the radius. I've bumped up the accuracy for the final gather to 500, 280,000 intensity f for the photons and 30 million photons. And as you can see I'm getting a very, very nice render going on here. And I'm pretty much happy with this result here. And as you can tell, it's been for this frame size and this very simple uh, scene, it took me almost three minutes to render this one image. But the result is well worth it. That pretty much wraps up the part of the global illumination and how it acts and how to use it. For a final preview of this image, let's go over to quality and set the max sampling level to 2. We'll decrease the anti-aliasing contrast to 0.05, sorry, 0 0.075. We'll set the filter to Mitchell. We'll set the ray tracing to refractions to 5, refractions to 5, max tracing to 5, shadows to 4, reflection blur limit to 2, and reflection refraction blur limit to 2. And we'll increase the image size to its, to its original size, that is 1280 by 720, and we'll render it. And let's see what we get. Okay, so this is the final render I've got after the render settings I have set up. It's very clean as you can see, very sharp. The materials are getting this uh, something between jelly bean substance and a uh, glass. And unfortunately I had to restart Maya. So we can see here the information of uh, how long it took me to render this image. If I recall correctly it took me around 8 minutes. So we'll save this image and we can honestly say that we are completely done with the global illumination part of the tutorial. And next we'll start with, with the photometric lighting part of the tutorial. So let's uh, save this and let's open up uh, the original file. We'll go to File, Save Scene As and we'll rename it to Photometric. 
tutorial. We need to set up again the basic render settings. So rent array and we're in Evelyn color management, sRGB. We want to render through the camera. We are rendering uh, 640 by 360 which is the half the resolution of 720p and we don't need any default light. In the quality tab we'll lower the samples to zero in the frame buffer, change the data rate to RGBA float 32 bits. In the indirect lighting tab we don't want any global illumination and no final gathering. In the comment tab I forgot to switch the image format to EXR. Again for compensatory reasons we'll render the image. Okay so this is our basic render. Now once again, let's go into Area Light and we want to turn off Intensity because we want to study completely the photometric lighting. To convert the light to photometric lighting, we once again we need to toggle down Manta Ray right to the bottom. Here under Custom Shaders we have Light Shaders and Futon Emitters. And we are actually going to use both, so let's open up the Hypershade. What we are looking for is the Manta Ray Lights. And here we've got all sorts of lights. And the first one is the one we are going to use, the Maya Photometric Light. Open that up. We need to insert this light to both these slides. Just middle mouse drag to both of them. Now let's start exploring this node. This node and this render is more simple than, than the global illumination. We have an on and off switch which uh, explains itself. We have the multiplier which uh, acts as a shear force. The more you dial this up, the brighter the light is. We have a light color. And then we have these four nodes. The intensity mode, the manual peaks intensity candela, now I have no idea what Candela stands for, but that's what the CD stands for. The Manual Flex LM and the Profile. Now, when the intensity mode is set to zero, photometric light would prefer only this value to the manual peak intensity. When it's set to one, it will refer only to the manual flux. <laughs> and when the intensity mode is set to two, it refers only to the prof. So let's start with zero, the manual peak intensity. Right now it's set to zero, so that means we should have no intensity. Let's run a test render. We get a black screen because we have no intensity. So let's uh, see, let's set it to 10, see what we get. And here we get some amount of lighting. Now remember, the area light itself isn't emitting any light whatsoever. Let's continue on dialing this number up, see how the result is getting. As you can see we are getting a pretty interesting result and in super fast time. Let's raise it to 100 maybe. And it's getting a bit burned. Okay, let's lower it to somewhere around 70. And this is pretty much a good uh, intensity. Okay, now let's start exploring manual flux. To convert to manual flux we need to set the intensity mode to 1. Now let's give it a test render and we get a black screen and that's because the manual flux is set to 0. And I think I had didn't save the last render so let's set it again to 0 and render it again. Save this image and now back to manual flux. We have no intensity, so let's again start with 10, see what we get. Okay, we're starting to see something, let's turn it to 100. And we're getting a bit more light in the scene, let's switch it to 500. Okay, so now we're getting something that's similar to the manual peak intensity, and I would say this one is a bit more subtle. Next we'll try the profile. So we'll turn intensity mode to 2 and now it refers only to the profile. Let's give it a test render 
and we get a black screen. And the reason for that is that the profile is working on IES light files. At the moment we have no IES light file attached, so we'll hit the checker button, we'll hit the folder button, IES lights, as all your source images, need to be stored in your source images file. And let's open that up. And let's see. Well, we have some amount of light right now, very low. And that's because our light is uh, somewhat far away from the scene at the moment, at least for, uh, for an IES light. We'll enhance the multiplier, let's say 50. And we get a much brighter scene. Let's uh, lower it to 40 maybe. If you would like to learn more about IES lights and how to use them, in CGTuts you can find one of my tutorials called Quick Tip What are IES lights and how to use them in Maya. It's a video tutorial and it uh, pretty much covers the whole subject. We have a few more uh, parameters here we haven't discussed. The distribution mode, when it's set to zero, it means that the light would act as a tropic light, which is to say it would shine to all directions. When it's set to one, it would tell the light to act as a spotlight, uh, which means we do, it would have to have a spectrometer, which our light don't have because it's an area light. When the distribution mode is set to two, it will drive it from the light profile, the IES light. So let's uh, give it a test render. And it's really, really too high because our multiplier is set to 40. Let's set it to one. And again, let's uh, lower the amount, let's say 0 0.1. Okay, maybe 0.05 we have a more subtle light distribution. This might actually work better when we're working with the spotlight and we have a nice cone here controlled by the spotlight Gaussian bias. Now the units to meter scale section, here's the deal. The world scale for Manta Ray is by default set to 1 meters, which is to say that every uh, grid square here is equal 1 meter. Even though that in this project I worked in centimeters and not meters, Mental Ray is, is uh, still calculating this world by meters. So that is to say if I'll uh, lower this value by 2, say 0.5, and render it again, I will get a much darker scene. So we need to adjust this value when according to our scene size. And the final node, the CM2 factor, by default, I, would, I wouldn't touch this value unless you are using the Maya Exposure Photographic node connected to your camera as a lens shader. In that case, you would have to match the value of the CM2 factor to the one in Maya Exposure Photographic lens shader. For this tutorial, I'm going to use the manual peak intensity Mandela, and so I'll switch this in the intensity mode to zero, we can get rid of the profile by right clicking on it and break connection. We'll set the distribution mode to zero. We'll set the multiplier back to one. We'll set the distribution mode back to zero. And we'll render it once more. Now, on its own, it's nothing too impressive. So, I will turn on the final gather and I will create an image-based lighting for it, same as before, with my HDR image, and let's give it another test render. Now the render time as it has increased, it's uh, 6 seconds versus 1 second that we had before, but you can see we have a very interesting look over here at the moment, and I think we can dial this up a bit, we can dial up the intensity, I would go all the way to 500, Let's uh, save this image and render it again. And we got rid of some of the bleach, some of the spottiness on the walls, and we get a bit more accurate render. However, we still have some spottiness on the wall, and I think we can get a bit better 
there. Let's raise the point intensity to 5. And let's see. So we are starting to get some uh, more accurate results here. As well as we are starting to see some light spilling. Over here we have some green, some orange. Over here we have some purple. And it's a real nice render and we wouldn't be getting that with finer gathering by itself. And I think we can even uh, increase that uh, this accuracy. Let's save this image. We'll set the point interpretation from 10. We'll double it to 20. And we'll set the secondary diffuse bounds from 0 to 1. And now we can see a, a definite improvement here. We're getting a much more uh, ambient occlusion like lighting. We got a lot of, uh, of light spinning here, here, on the bottom even. In the dark spots we got a nice little uh, orange spot. On this wall we got a nice little purple hue. And it's a real nice result. And it took me 1 minute and 25 seconds. And let's save this image for a second and let's delete the photometric light node. Let's break the connection, right click and break the connection. And let's render it with final gathering only. And we'll see the difference. And this is the result we're getting with final gather only and with the intensity set to 1. And really, there's nothing to compare here. The amount, as you can see, the amount for final gather only is 1 minute and 13 seconds. And with the photometric node, it takes me um, approximately 12 seconds more. And the result is so beautiful comparing the two. I'll go back to my area light, turn off the intensity, and reconnect the photometric uh, node. Okay, now let's go back to our render settings and let's start dialing up the settings here for the final render. We'll set the reflections to 5 un under the final gathering tracing, that is, and reflection to 5, max tracing to 10. Under quality, we'll set the D-ray tracing to 5, 5, 10, and 4 to 2. We'll set the max sampling level to 2, the anti-aliasing contrast to 0 0.075. We'll set the multi-pixel filtering to Mitchell. And finally, the, in the common tab, we'll set the image size back to our 720p, HD 720. Save our work and render. And my render is complete. In approximately half the time it took me to render it in global illumination. The shader is now looking more opaque. Somewhere between a plastic and a parceline. This is the ambient occlusion render. And this is the photometric render. Now, in render time, there's nothing to compare. Photometric render is a lot faster. It, it adds so much to your render when using Final Gather. And obviously, you get a different look than the global illumination. But then again, that depends on the look you are after. Our global illumination is uh, much brighter, but then, then again, we could uh, increase the lighting but by uh, increasing the multiplier or the amount in the manual peak intensity. Two methods of rendering not so commonly used, sometimes even overlooked, it pretty much covers the subject I want to discuss with you about. And well, that's just about it, folks. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. Once again, my name is Raman Avraham, and I'll see you next time.